So the, the primary goals of the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre um, listed here. So first of all, prevention, which is uh, primarily what I coordinate through, you know, various in initiatives throughout the year. Um, we were heavily involved and we organized for the most part uh, Fraud Prevention Month, which is in March every, every year. Um, last year, we focused on the tools of the fraudsters. So what what tools are fraudsters using to, to victimize Canadians, right? So whether they're using um, compromised social media accounts, um, caller ID spoofing, um, search engine optimization, which is another big one. We really wanted to focus on sharing that information with the public to know, you know, if you know what tools the fraudsters are using, then it's giving you the tools to protect yourself from being a victim. So that's just one example. Um, of course, Cyber Month was last month where the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre published five bulletins um, covering the top cyber frauds that affected Canadians in 2022, um, which included online extortion, buying and selling online, investment scams, and um, service scams. Um, many other initiatives throughout the year. Uh, of course, we share a lot of information with the media, social media on our website, um, as many outlets as we can. And of course, through webinars and presentations like we're doing today. Um, <clears throat> now moving down the list, disruption of criminal activities. So uh, one of the other units is the operational support unit, which I'll go into a little into detail a little later as well. Um, so in other words, if you report a fraudulent phone number, we work with private sector partners to possibly assist in, in shutting down these, these phone numbers. Um, intelligence, disseminate intelligence. So, you know, that goes back to being a central repository for mass marketing fraud in, in Canada, um, where we link information or intelligence together and we're able to, to share that information with international law enforcement agencies. Um, goes back to supporting law enforcement as well. So if there's a, an ongoing investigation, sometimes these agencies will come to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center to, to support their, their investigation um, with the information that we collect as well. And um, partnerships, of course, between the private and public sectors, primarily for um, prevention and um, all the other ones listed here, disruption, intelligence, support, right? So. In a nutshell, that's, that's what uh, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center's mandate is. Um, now, going into the different unit, various units that we have, uh, the unit that I currently work in is a fraud prevention and, and intake unit. <clears throat> so the FPIU handles all incoming reports of fraud, inputs the information into the CFC database, and publishes public-facing fraud prevention messaging. Um, it also features an inbound call center and online fraud reporting system, which is on our website. As I mentioned, call center operations are fraud specialists who validate online reports, answer inbound fraud attempt and victim calls, record the information and provide education, support and the appropriate referrals. Um, reports are, are referred to the other two uni units when they meet specific conditions. So, uh, for example, if it's a senior victim, um, that requires follow-up. It's referred to our senior support unit. If it's a large dollar loss victim, um, if there's a police visit recommended for, um, uh, you know, a, a wellness check, if there's cash in the mail or anything new that, you know, a new twist is what we call it. So a new, let's say a new scam comes in and that, that's referred because we have to be able to share that information with the public um, to be able to alert them. and. Um, you know, something we've been doing for the last couple of years is if we get a good concrete example of a scam or a current scam, we want to try to share that example with the public on our, our social media pages. So you get a good visual of what that scam looks like and, and what to watch for instead of, you know, seeing a bunch of text. It's a more effective method for, for Canadians to be able to see what's circulating. Now, moving on to the operational support unit, um, the OSU is a recognized intelligence unit made up of analysts and intel researchers and profilers. The OSU works closely with law enforcement agencies, regulatory bodies in Canada and the U.S., um, private corporations, financial institutions, and internet service providers to, to detect and deter fraud and criminal operations within Canada and internationally. So, 
<clears throat> of course, education's in there, investigative packages, uh, the USU or analyst share, international outreach, and of course, uh, disruption, which I, I touched on a little earlier. Now, the senior support unit has 40 volunteers, um, 30 seniors and 10 students. Volunteers perform victim callbacks, mail out and presentations to groups and associations. Um, so, yeah, basically when, you know, if we, the FPIU, the Fraud Prevention Intake Unit, get a phone call from a senior victim, in a lot of cases, these files are referred to our senior support unit where a volunteer will do a callback and provide all kinds of uh, steps to follow, resources, um, you know, what they should be doing next, what to, who they should be contacting if they're a victim of identity theft or identity fraud. And on top of that, we have a group of senior volunteers that go around, um, primarily Ontario, but around Canada and do fraud prevention presentations, kind of like the one I'm, I'm doing today. Um, now there's, you know, in a lot of cases, these, these volunteers have been victim to a scam so they can really relate to to the victim you know whether it's over the phone or whether it's doing a, a presentation and this is one of the unit i mean this is the unit that makes the canadian anti-fraud center very unique is having this um this group of volunteers being able to to assist in what we do <clears throat> now reported losses um and as you can see on on this page here 2019 uh, you know 150 million was lost roughly to mass marketing fraud. And if we compare that to 2022, over half a billion, 531 million. So a massive jump um, in, in overall losses reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. And from what we're seeing, it's, it's largely due to <clears throat> uh, the emergence of cryptocurrency and investment scams. But we, we've seen uh, the dollar loss increase over a bunch of different scams. And, um, you know, uh, the emergence of technology um you know we're we're seeing people spending more time online because they've adapted new habits because of the pandemic uh whether people are doing more online banking they're shopping online more than they have in the past all contribute to that that large increase in dollar loss and um even more reason to to do presentations and fraud prevention um even more but with that being said the canadian anti-fraud center can only do too much it's so important for Canadians to take any information that they have or any knowledge that they have on fraud prevention and, you know, how to protect yourself and share that information with loved ones or family members that we think may be at risk. And um, yeah, so if we all do it together, we can try to, to bring that number down um, substantially. <clears throat> so from what we're seeing, mass marketing fraud impacts all regions of Canada um it really correlates to popula population density so in, in other words you know um, when we're looking at the provincial breakdown of course ontario is going to have a, a larger amount loss than than a smaller province right so um mass marketing fraud affects everyone um with that being said uh seniors tend to lose more money on average so out of all the age categories um adults 60 and over account for 25% of overall losses. So when we're looking at investment scams with over 300 and, and you know, a little over 300 million lost in 2022, 75 million was lost by um, Canadians 60 and over. Um, now, on top of that, I did touch on, on cyber enable fraud, which has increased, unfortunately, over the last number of years, um, accounts for 70% of reported losses to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. So, um, you know, not to downplay the fact that a lot of scams are being um, initiated over the telephone because it, they still are, as we all know. I, I think we all get um, a fraudulent phone call once in a while. But uh, when we're looking at dollar loss, it, it primarily, you know, 70% 70 per, 70 is lost by through cyber-enabled frauds. <clears throat> So it's actually estimated that five to 10% of all fraud is reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. Um, victims of fraud may suffer financial and emotional abuse and even medical problems relating to their victimization. They're not alone as millions of people are victims of fraud every year. 
Um, there, there's a few different contributing factors of why victims are, are reluctant or don't report to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. So it could be that they feel ashamed and embarrassed of what happened and they, they don't want to discuss it with anybody. They, they may have the perce perception that no one will believe them or the law enforcement won't, won't investigate. So, you know, in other words, like what's the point of, of reporting if there, there's not going to be an investigation, right? Um, they may have fear their family will take control over their finances and if they'll lose their, their independence, they may not even know that they're a victim of fraud in, in, in many cases. Um, they may be blaming themselves for the losses and um, or maybe they won't report the, the incident unless they are guaranteed restitution or a refund for, for the funds that they may have lost. So a few different contributing factors, um, even more reason for us, for the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center to, to get the word out, do sessions like we're doing today to make people who are Canadians understand the, the reason for, for reporting. Um, now, the, the main reason is, um, first of all, if you have been a victim, very important to, to, to contact your local police because they have the ability to, to investigate. Um, you know, if you're in any kind of danger, whatever the case may be, then they are the authority to, to report to you. Um, of course, if you have been a victim, important to report to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre as well. Um, you don't have to be a victim to report to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. So even if you have, you know, you received a phone call and you have information, phone numbers or, um, you know, contact information, addresses that you want to share, then you can report that as well. Um, as I mentioned, we do work with law enforcement across the country and um, internationally, but it's not guaranteed that what you're reporting to local police is shared with the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. So it is important to, to report to both if you have been a victim. Now, there, there are two ways to report to the CAFC. You can call our toll-free number between 9 and 5 p.m. And our phone number is 1-888-495-8501. Or you can report online through our fraud reporting system at uh, on our website, antifraudcenter.ca. And as you can see here, um, that's basically a picture of our, our, our main page of our website, um, <clears throat> different tabs. So the third tab is report fraud. You would click on that tab. And um, the next step is where a lot of Canadians get, get stuck and find themselves not being able to report. But fairly simple. Um, you have two options. You can report through a GC key, which is a, a kind of a fancy name for a username and password. So basically, if you don't have a GEC key, um, very simple. You can register for one by creating a username and a password. Once that's done, you'll be able to log in and file your report. Or the other option is by using a, a sign-in partner, which is your financial institution. Um, you know, we're aware that a lot of people aren't comfortable doing that. And understandably, um, easiest way is to use a GC key. If you don't have one, register for one, and then you'll, you'll be able to, to file a report fairly easily. So that, uh, that concludes my presentation for today. We'll move on to, to questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jeff, for the great presentation and overview. There was a, a couple questions here. Um, if uh, how many clients buying? So she says, I have many clients are buying Apple gift cards and romance scams. Should this be reported to the local police or the anti fraud center? Great question. So it, it should actually be reported to local police and the Canadian anti fraud center to both. Although we do share the information, um, it's not guaranteed that the information is shared at all times. So it's it's important to report to both. Okay. And then the, they, the two departments will talk to each other if it's um, further investigated at the local level, or how does that process work? So the Canadian, we don't uh, we don't investigate at all. Um, what we do is we you know put, collect the information and um, help with linking the information. You know, so if there's a victim in in Toronto and another victim in um, you know another part of Ontario and Sudbury, then the information can be easily linked together through. The central repository, which is the Canadian Anti Fraud Center. But um, with that being said, local police would have the ability to to investigate. 
Okay. And then you were just explaining about reporting online. Someone's just asking, what is a GC key? And I think, you know, I've, I've gone online and I've looked at it and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that or it looks complicated or, and then going through a bank, kind of not sure why, why they have that. And I think you said they're changing that system, but maybe you can explain what that is. Yeah. So, uh, so basically the first part of that question, the GC key is a government of Canada key. Um, it, it's a fancy name for username and password, quite honestly. So um, from what we've seen, that that's easy, the most simple way to, to be able to report is by using that. And if you don't have one, you can just register for one. And all it asks for, it won't even ask for personal information. It'll ask you to create a username and a password. And once that's done, you'll be able to, to use that username and password that you created to log in through the GC key and you'll be able to, to file your, your, your online report. With that being said though, with the new NCFRS that I mentioned, um, it's looking like that's going to be eliminated. And that's coming out in the new year, you said? Uh, probably in the later part of 2024, yeah. Okay. Um, if I'm a senior and I want to become involved in your, your unit that you have for seniors that, that does education or does outreach or and the roles that they play, how does someone, um, if they're interested in volunteering, how do they get involved in that? And is there training that's involved in that? Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's, uh, honestly, it's not a question that I can answer right now off the top of my head, but, um, what I can do is I can get back to, to Rayanne and maybe she can share that information with uh, the person that asked the question. Okay. Is how many, do you don't know how many people like seniors are involved in that program or are they, I'm assuming they're all over Ontario. Yeah, they're mostly, um, honestly, mostly located in North Bay because that's where our, our office is, but um, I'm almost hundred percent sure that there are opportunities for you know, different areas of Ontario to, to be able to do presentations or whatever the case. Okay. Um, does the operational support unit provide in-person education presentations? So just sort of building off what I, what we were just talking about. So uh, no, mostly myself that, that'll uh, do education presentations. So for the most part, what I do is uh, my fraud prevention presentations, I'll, I'll break down like different types of scams, um, you know, the top scams that we're seeing, how they work, uh, what you can do to protect yourself. It's just that the webinar today was a little different than, than what I normally do, um, where we wanted to focus on, you know, why report to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, because I think there's this belief that, um, <clears throat> you know, there's no point in reporting because they don't investigate, but there, there's way more to it than, than that, as you can see. So I have a really good question here around, um, you know, speaking with clients, we often have home care workers that are going into homes and they see these potential uh, victims of, of scams and frauds. And so there's a couple questions here. What does the experience look like when a victim actually does call in? Like, are they, I'm just thinking the, their emotional well-being. I know in years past, I've had an individual who um, had called in and concerned about their a uh, neighbor who was a senior who was you know, suicidal because of all the money he had lost and embarrassment. So what is the, what are those calls or is there urgency? Like how, what do they look like when they call? Yeah. So that's a great question. And honestly, fraud, being a victim of fraud can affect everybody differently. Um, you know, I've dealt with people where they were um, in a, you know, people, some people might be in a huge panic because they lost a social insurance number and think, you know, it, it's the end of the world. <clears throat> Whereas another person may not react that way, right? Um, that being said, being a victim of fraud can be detrimental. And um, of course, if anybody's, um, you know, mentioning suicide, like you, you mentioned, Rianne, then local police have to be involved and, and notified immediately. Okay. Then the other question is, you know, sometimes we know that the person's being scammed. You can see it. The financial loss has been happening. Um, how, and they've had that conversation, but they still believe that the, this is a real scenario. It's, I know this happens a lot with romance scams, um, but um, do we tell them to contact the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre? But what would help the client determine if they're being scammed? Like what would you help the client if they called to the fraud center, is there any communication that goes to them to convince them or to 
verify um, that they actually are being scammed because there are ways that you talk to them that might be different than a service provider or a, a neighbor or somebody? Yeah, because, um, and th that's a great question. Um, so that, that really depends on what type of scam that they're dealing with. So if they're dealing with like, you know, you mentioned romance and there, there are tools, of course, due to the fact that, you know, we speak to multiple victims throughout the day, we can, you know, mention that, Hey, I just spoke to another victim in the same situation as you. Um, this is a hundred percent a scam. Um, you know, and then we give, you know, with the romance scam, we can give them resources or, you know, if it's a family member calling on behalf of the victim, you know, trying to convince, we can give, provide resources to do a reverse image search. Um, because in a lot of cases, you know, sticking to romance scams, what, what suspects are doing or what criminals are doing is that they're, they're taking a picture that of a famous person in another country we're not familiar with, or a model from another country. Right. So by doing a reverse image search, um, it, it'll pull up all the names associated to that, that photo that have been used. Because in a lot of cases, the fraudsters will use a bunch of different names with with the photo that they're using, right? So that that's one example. Um, <clears throat> of course, with prize scams, we have to you know let them know that if you didn't enter into a contest and you cannot win money, um, you can't bring in prize money from another country. So it really depends on the scam that we're talking about, but. Um, our call takers definitely have the tools to, to try to convince victims that they're, they're being victimized, which can be challenging. But um, if it does happen, um, you can refer them to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center for sure. And is there follow up, um, Jeff, to back to the clients just to if someone is sort of, you know, um, unstable or you want to check, is there any sort of check in back to that individual when they do call just to see how they're doing or um and that communication or is it just that one phone call and you don't keep data or like how does that work there is follow-up uh specifically for for seniors uh that's what the senior support unit does so if this okay. does happen then our fraud prevention intake unit will refer the file to the senior support unit who will follow up and make sure that everything is okay and provide more resources and um uh, you know so yes yeah, service follow-up okay um Still can see, uh, it's not questions. Still have to see if anybody has any other questions for Jeff. Um, currently, like the top scams are still romance scams um, online. Like, is it more of that or is it the cybersecurity? What are you seeing, you know, right now? We're coming into Christmas. Um, I know the frauds change all the time. Um, but is there something that we should be, you know, looking out for that you're seeing right now as a trend? Yeah, and I, honestly, I can I can talk about um, I'd probably be able to talk about this for about an hour, um, but most notably, of course, like I mentioned, investment scams have been at the top. When we're looking at the top reported scams based on dollar loss, <clears throat> investment scams, romance scams are, are at the top of the list, and we're actually seeing that those are are intertwined a little bit, where a victim may start communicating with a suspect online through a dating website or social media or whatever the case may be. And then they're convinced down the line to invest into this fraudulent uh, cryptocurrency platform, right? Because criminals are doing this because they've gained the victim's trust and they're able to convince them to, to do a lot of stuff that they, they wouldn't have been right if they didn't gain that trust. So that's one example. Um, of course, holiday season is right around the corner. Like you mentioned, Rayanne, um, buying and buying merchandise online, fraudulent ads on social media. Um, I touched on search engine optimization a little bit earlier. So I know it's a big word that uh, the general public doesn't really understand that this refers to, um, let's say you're having an issue with uh, your computer and you, you type in, um, you know, Apple support because you have an Apple computer. Chances are the first five to 10 results you see are going to be fraudulent ads, right? So you want to make sure that you're going to the legitimate website for the company in question. Um, same thing when looking to purchase merchandise. If you're looking to go to a specific company or a brand's website, you want to make sure that you're going to that legitimate company's website. So um, those are some of the top scans that we're seeing. Obviously, way more that I can cover, but I think we're, um, yeah. Um, there was just a comment from the uh, uh, regarding the advocacy center. So we're talking about mortgage fraud, and I know that 
Um, there's been a few episodes on um, uh, Marketplace and W5 on the mortgage fraud scams. Um, and Advocacy Center has done a great re article. I know they've been doing some initiatives. They talked about that, I think, at their AGM as well. Um, can you speak to the, the mortgage fraud scheme that's happening? Um, and if that's growing in nature, um, I know people are losing their homes uh, in some of these cases, um, as well as, you know, their life savings. Yeah, so I, I can um, I can touch on it a little bit. Um, so what's happening is, in some cases, um, it, it starts off as a service scam where, you know, <clears throat> frauds are go in and they're offering a service, whether it be, you know, to put uh, or to put a, a new um, uh, sorry, a, a new heater, let's say, or a new furnace in your home, and you have to sign a contract. The victim will sign the contract not knowing that there's a clause in there that you may be signing over your home, right? Um, so it's a huge issue. Um, we don't have stats on it, unfortunately, because it is linked to identity fraud. <clears throat> but um, all this to say is that, you know, if if you're ever signing a contract, especially something that, that involves your home, um, get a review by a lawyer. Um, you know, get advice, contact uh, Consumer Protection in Ontario, um, you know, take all the necessary steps before signing any kind of important document. And of course, um, on the other hand, um, if there's application for mortgages, this has to go through the credit bureaus. So you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on your credit report through Equifax and TransUnion. Mm -hmm. Very important to do both because certain banks are using Equifax, whereas other financial institutions are using TransUnion. Um, I think there's, you know, <clears throat> most people think that if they contact one, they're protected. Very important to contact both. And just so people know that that's free once a year, I believe, right? It is. Yeah. So, you know, getting that, uh, you know, knowledge. And I think sometimes some of the banks also have a credit report that you can get uh, generate on your bank when you do banking that you can get that generated just to see if there is any thing going on in your own banking. Um, so just sort of being forewarned about any you know, potential um, identity theft, I guess, in terms of your own banking and et cetera. So, um, cause you just never know, right. In terms of. It's, it's so important. And I think, you know, um, <clears throat> I think going back to the eighties and nineties, uh, we didn't have to do this kind of stuff, right. We just, um, Canadians had to go into the bank and ask for a loan and they, they got a loan. Now the way it works is that if we're ever applying for credit, if we're applying for a credit card or a cell phone or, um, or whatever, right. Yeah. Our information has to get verified through either Equifax and TransUnion, and that's why it's so important to to keep an eye on that. It's your number one indicator to um, to detect uh, if you're a victim of identity fraud or identity theft. Exactly. Uh, just check and see. Oh. Someone's just asking about income tax and RSPs. Does the Tax Act render human rights provision to be fraudulent misrepresentation and the theft of RRSPs benefits to be a crime? Uh, do you know what? I, I would love to answer that, but I think specific. that's more of a question for this TRA. Right. Yeah, it sounds like more of a, that their division as opposed to anti-fraud center. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, um, I want to thank you, Jeff, again. Um, Jeff is also, just for those who are online, uh, we are going to be uh, doing a webinar uh, in mid-November uh, on the 21st with the Ontario Security uh, Commission, as well as the RCMP and uh, Anti-Fraud Centre on AI, Scams and Fraud Prevention Investment Scams um, to provide more information on that just specific issue on the 21st. So you'll see more communication coming out of that um, shortly, I believe in our next newsletter, which may come out tomorrow or Monday. Um, so we're continuing to try to educate people to prevent the financial loss of people's life savings and um, you know their assets because these people are, are very professional at what they do and unfortunately are um, you know having detrimental effects on seniors' financial well-being and their emotional well-being and it just crosses over so many impacts on their lives so thank you again Jeff and thank you for everyone attending we're done a couple minutes early um, some claps and some positive comments for the session we will join back uh, for our final keynote presentation 
um, that will happen at 3.15. So I have a little bit of time in between. Uh, and then we're going to be talking about sort of those ethical dilemmas um, around uh, about reporting, because you know, even in cases of frauds and scams, people may say, well, it's not really my duty to report or show. I see something going on with my neighbor and there's a scam, but you know, what should I do in these circumstances? So we'll have some further clarification on the principles, ethic principles and frameworks of reporting, because people down still have the right to make decisions, even in these situations of scams. As much as we tell people, they still, if they're capable, they still have the decision to decide if they want not to believe it or to believe it. And it's kind of sometimes it's difficult to to convince people this is not appropriate, um, but people have the right to make decisions as anybody else. So um, anyway, play, please uh, tune in for our last session. And um, again, thank you for our interpreters and for Jeff, and we'll talk to everyone uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.